Well, good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church. It's great to have you with us today. Happy New Year, by the way. First Sunday of 2018. How many of you have messed up writing that date already this year? All right, you're writing 17 still. I've only had to write it twice, and I haven't messed up yet, but uh, the year's still young. Uh, welcome. If you are a guest today, you honor us by your presence today. I know some of you are here because of baptisms, and you're here to support and encourage uh, someone who's being baptized today. Between the two services, we are baptizing 14 people this morning, all right? So it's a very, very exciting way to kick off the new year. And uh, so thank you for being here. If you are a guest uh, and you're sitting out in the pews, uh, <laughs> there are some cards in the back of the pew uh, that are there for you to fill out, drop in the offering when it comes by. Uh, we make a promise. We're not going to come knock on your door. We're not going to call you on the telephone. But through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about New Hope, our staff, our ministries, times of services, hopefully answer most of your questions. And we would love to get that information to you. Those cards are also available to our regular church family. If you need to get messages to our staff, prayer requests, updates on things, please take advantage of those. We tend to those every Tuesday morning, very first thing, and so we'll be very quick to respond to those. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm going to highlight just a few things, make a couple of uh, uh, updates on prayer requests, and then we will get engaged in our worship and our baptisms today. Uh, I'm, uh, there's a lot of things just starting. It's the beginning of the year, and so things were kind of on hold for the holidays. There kicking off again, please take the opportunity to check the bulletin. Women's Bible studies are starting up this Tuesday and this Wednesday. Men's Bible studies are getting started again. So please read the program, and if you want to participate in those, the times and schedules are there. Um, this is the beginning of the year, and so what's very important for our office staff, required by law, we have to get out giving letters, all right, before the month is over. Uh, if your address has changed this past year and you have not informed the office, that's a problem, all right? So please take the opportunity to fill out one of those cards, write on it, change of address, give us what it is, call the office this week. Uh, if at the end of the month you have not received one, then please call the office and they will will make good on it. You also, uh, if you are part of the CCB address thing, you can go in actually and print your own. You can't print anybody else's, but you can actually print your own if you are sort of computer functional, all right? Uh, but otherwise, it will come in the mail, and we want to get those to you. It's also the first uh, senior luncheon this Tuesday over in our bridge building. That's Tuesday at noon. It's our first men's breakfast uh, this coming Saturday, January the 13th. Coffee's ready at 7.30, breakfast ready at 8. So you got lunch Tuesday, you got breakfast on Saturday, and I'm going to tell you that tomorrow starts 21 days of prayer and fasting. How do you like that as I talk about the lunch and the breakfast, all right? Um, it's a citywide thing. Actually, it's nationwide that's going on. We've been participating for the last couple of years, uh, 21 days of prayer, and then you choose what you're going to fast. Uh, some people, the traditional thing is, I'm not going to eat for 21 days. That might not be healthy for a few of you. For more of us, it would be very healthy for us, all right? <laughs> uh, you can choose to fast from something, all right? Um, here's what's not a good idea. See, it wouldn't be good for me to fast from chocolate. I hate chocolate. So that would not be a sacrifice. The idea of prayer and fasting is I'm going to give up something that gives me time and thought towards my relationship with God. Some people last year gave up Facebook. That was harder on them than giving up food, all right? But, but you find something that consumes time and thought and energy, and you say, for 21 days, I'm going to devote my time and thoughts towards my relationship with God rather than to that event, thing, or food. Does that make sense? And so that starts tomorrow. Today there is a kickoff service at Mountain View Church at 5 o'clock. We also have our regular service here at 6 o'clock. They'll be highlighting that as well. Uh, but there'll be a community-wide kickoff at 5 o'clock at Mountain View Church. Every, every day for 21 days, there is going to be a prayer and worship service 
at some church in town. If you got the email this week, you got the whole list, all right? If you didn't get an email, call the office. We'll send it out to you uh, of where those services will be. We are hosting one next Saturday evening. On Saturday the 13th, 5 to 6 o'clock, we'll be hosting uh, a citywide uh, prayer and worship service here going along with the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Tim Kepler's coming a day early, so he's going to lead us in our worship time from 5 to 6 uh, and our prayer time. So that will be next Next Saturday evening. All right. Um, one of the things that you might be praying for during your 21 days of prayer and fasting is uh, we have a team of eight leaving on February the 3rd for Ivory Coast Africa. Uh, this will be my sixth year in a row. For some, it's their fourth year in a row. For some, it is their very first trip. We will join, be joining about 54 others from around the United States and Canada, doctors and nurses and construction folks, uh, as we will be going back to our adopted village in Neonan and also doing medical work out of the community of Duropo. So you could make that part of your prayer time over these next 21 days. Um, God's timing and sense of humor I often find fascinating. Don't ask me how I got on this email list. But I got on an email list, and it's called Six Pack Abs. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I, have, I have exchanged my six pack for a keg, all right, is what I've been doing lately. But anyway, I'm on this email for Six Pack Abs, and, and, and it came in this morning while I was at my desk finishing touches on today's sermon. And here's what it said. Listen to this. This is about fasting. Fasting burns fat. Now that's good. I think most of us knew that. Here's what I didn't know. And it fights aging. Ah, uh, now some of you are interested in the 21 days of prayer and fasting, aren't you? Yeah. Anyway, I, I really don't know if it's true or not considering the source, but thought I would throw it out to you today. Also, our, uh, our Africa uh, missionaries from our church are going to be meeting this afternoon right after the third service, so please be praying for them. Uh, next week, we're going to be launching our church-wide Bible study for the next uh, five to six weeks. Uh, it is in correlation with our small group kickoff. We're doing this church-wide study, and it's entitled, All the Places to Go, How Will We Know? It's looking at the subject of open doors. How can we tell when God has opened a door for us and that we ought to walk through that door? And we'll also wrap up with looking how do we recognize the closed door. Because we have a tendency to avoid open doors and to knock down closed doors. And so how do we figure out the difference between those two? Uh, some of you are saying, Tim, I'm not part of a small group in this church. Not a problem. Sunday mornings, we're going to talk about the subject in the message. Sunday evenings in our 6 o'clock service, they're going to be showing the video and have some discussion things. And uh, so you could come and make Sunday evening your small group. And at the end of the five to six weeks, you could say, hey, this was kind of fun. I want to join a small group. And they'll make a brand new one. All right? And you can be a part of that. If you were already part of a small group, don't ignore Sunday nights. You could show up on Sunday nights, and you will have a step up on the other people in your small group. They'll think you're really smart, and they're going to wonder what happened in the new year to you. No, just, just kidding. All right, so that's starting this, uh, this next Sunday. Uh, Ethan Smith, he's one of the kids who grew up in our church. He's in college now, started here as a baby. He is uh, Rich and Regina's son. Um, he is also one of our leaders for our 4th, 5th, and 6th graders on Wednesday evenings. But he's taking a leave of absence from that for a few months because he's heading to Costa Rica. He's going to be on a mission and study trip with Fresno Pacific University. So if you see Ethan as he is coming in for the last service and you are going out, give him a hug. Tell him that you're going to miss him. Hey, if you want to, slip him a $20 bill, all right? Uh, but anyway, we're going to miss Ethan for being around here. Um, all right, I want to say a big thank you for your generosity to New Hope last year. Uh, if you've checked the bulletin, if you happen to look at that little giving box, we don't hide too much around here. Uh, the month of December was a record month all the way around. The last Sunday of the month was a record Sunday. The entire month of December was a record month for New Hope Church. Um, and you will notice uh, we accomplished something we thought we were going to mess up this year. For six years in a row, when we proposed a budget as staff and board to the church family, we were always able to say, this is an increase over the previous year's budget, but it is less than what you gave this year. When we presented that budget the 1st of December, we didn't think that was true. 
It was above the previous year, but we didn't think that uh, it would be less than what was given. But because you all were so generous the very last week of the year, next year's budget actually is less than what you gave this year. So, thank you for keeping the streak alive, all right, and your generosity there. And we get to share that with so many other missions and ministries around the world. Some areas of prayer request. Uh, John Christensen, uh, he and his family were part of our church for many, many years. Uh, a couple of years ago, John was no longer able to come to church because of Alzheimer's and its rapid decline and impact on his life. Uh, John was a real estate agent for over 30 years in the community. Uh, John's the kind of guy that always had a smile on his face, and he did his very last day. John went home to be with the Lord the latter part of this week, and his service is going to be here at the church next, um, next Saturday at 11 o'clock. And so would appreciate you praying for um, his wife, Patsy, and his daughter, Annie, and uh, we'll let you know more about that, all right? But service will be here at 11 o'clock next week. Betty Prieto, part of the Prieto family here in Clovis, she passed away, and her service is going to be on Wednesday at the Veterans Memorial Building. Doug Eaton Sr., his son Steve, is a regular part of our church family. Uh, Doug was part of our church family, got in with a group of guys over at Clovis Hills, was there, very active for several years. Over his last couple of years, when his health was up to it, uh, he and his wife Linda would, would be back with us. And Doug passed away uh, yesterday morning. And I don't know any details about that service yet. And then we have two families with the last name of Lyle, and they are not related to each other. Uh, but each of them have lost members of their family this past week, and services are being scheduled for them. So just a few uh, updates of folks that we want you to remember to, to be praying for. Uh, Richard Heath, I haven't read this yet. Didn't I see that? Yeah, Richard Heath, let's see, what's going on with you? You are having a biopsy tomorrow morning, so we will be praying for you about that. Liver, all right, we will be praying for you about that. So thank you very, very much. And then Friday, we did a service here for Ariel Medellis, um, 53 years old. Uh, the day after Christmas, he wanted to take a nap, and he went to heaven. Is that... His wife said it exactly like that. He said, he went, took a nap, and when I went to wake him up, I discovered he was in heaven. And uh, what a wonderful family. They're grown sons. Uh, one is a detective for the Fresno Police Department, and uh, the other one didn't like banking, and so he went back to school, and he's about to finish his master's so he can become a teacher and a coach. And what is a wonderful, wonderful family. Be praying for them during this, this season as well. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and offering. Most of you know this is Baptism Sunday. That's the reason I'm dressed like this. This is for the convenience of changing clothes. I'm going to slip back into that room. I'm going to change my clothes. Those of you who are going to be baptized, you are going to follow Linda out that door. And uh, I will meet you at the back door. Please do not come in that back door till I tell you it's okay. I will be in some form of undress, all right? So uh, I'll... Didn't want to put that visual in your head, but uh, any, anyway, uh, would you join with us as we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for the love that you share with us. Thank you for this beginning of the year Sunday and our chance to share with friends that we've known for a long time, with folks who we've just been getting acquainted with over, the over these last few months, and we get to share with them in a most special event called baptism. Baptism was so important that the Lord Jesus, even though he didn't need it, did it. He did it as a testimony of, of, of submission and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, to God, his Father. And Jesus wanted to set an example that just as, as he had done this in submission to his Father, that we do this uh, as a symbol of our submission to Jesus Christ. And so thank you for the joy of sharing in this service with ten who, uh, who have made a profession in their faith, some recently, some many years ago. Uh, we, have, we have one who is, is, is going through this again because it's been so many years and things have happened this past year that have just been so meaningful that they wanted to take this, this step of commitment again. And so we are so grateful to share with them. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing today. Lord Jesus, we want you to be exalted in our presence. We want to acknowledge you as Lord and Savior of our life. We don't want to use you just as insurance. We want to use you as the, the way in which we live every moment of every day. We live in a cruel, harsh world, and it's not always kind to us. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean that we won't experience the realities of a troubled world. But, Father, your promise to us is in the midst of trouble, you're an overcomer. And you can enable us to be more than conquerors because of your life in us. 
So thank you for that privilege. We commit to you this and so much more at the beginning of 2018. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. Amen and amen. There was a wife who woke up one morning and she said, Honey, I just had a dream that you bought me a gold necklace. What do you think that means? He said, I don't know, but Valentine's Day is coming. Tuesday you'll know. A few nights later, she woke up again after another dream. She said, Babe, this time I dreamed you gave me a pearl necklace. What do you think that means? He said, You'll know Tuesday, dear. The night before Valentine's Day, she again woke up telling him about her dream. This time I dreamed you bought me a diamond necklace. What do you think that means? Honey, you'll know tonight. That evening when he got home, he gave her a present. As she unwrapped the present, delighted, excited, she found a book. <laughs> the name of the book was The Meaning of Dreams. He probably did not have a Hallmark Valentine's Day evening, all right? I'm just guessing, but um, we all know what it's like to experience disappointment. If you'll recall last week as we kind of wrapped up our year looking at the previous sermon series, as I kind of got to the end, I told you that I, um, one, of, one of our goals that I think all of us should have in life is we get to a place to where we understand what Paul meant when he said, let's pray without ceasing. And this is an idea that doesn't mean that we go from the time we wake up till the time we go to bed with our heads bowed, our hands folded, and our eyes closed, and that we are talking to God about something. Paul understood that prayer was a conversation with God. So this idea about praying without ceasing is that there is this open line of communication to where not only are we talking to him, but we have these ears that are attuned to hearing his whisper, his voice his direction in our lives. We talked about one of the important things is we have to get the Word of God in our hearts so the Holy Spirit can bring it to our attention at the most uh, unusual moments when we have decisions to make, particularly important ones. And um, I told you that sometimes God speaks to us in the most peculiar of circumstances. Do you remember in the Old Testament the story of Balaam? You remember what was peculiar about the way God spoke to him? Yeah, somebody said it out loud. It's okay. You can say it louder. Yeah, he spoke to him through an ass. Okay? Uh, that's King James language, okay? I'm not cussing in the pulpit, all right? Uh, it was his donkey that stopped in the middle of the road, turned around and started talking to him. We have no idea. Well, it wasn't a donkey that talked to me two weeks ago, but it was a sports broadcaster. I was riding in my car, and there was a sports radio talk show on, and this guy was talking, and he made two statements that... I have no idea what he was talking about because what I heard was what God was talking about to me. Here were those two statements. Would you prefer to feel the pain of disappointment or the pain of discipline? Now what is true in sports? Most of us who were in sports, we understand the lingo of no pain, no gain. That is, you do the work and practice so that when the game is on the line, you know how to respond and act. Is that not also true in our own personal walk with Jesus Christ? We need to have rehearsed through study of scriptures, through worship, through conversation with God's family, rehearsed the truths of God so that when our life is on the line, when important decisions impacting us socially and financially and spiritually and relationally are on the line, we don't blow it. Because we hear the voice of God bring into our attention the direction that God has for us. But, but, but if we don't discipline ourselves to certain practices in our spiritual life, then we will experience the pain of disappointment. There's a lot of folks right now, this week in fact, who've experienced the pain of disappointment. You see, because, because during the holiday time, you didn't practice the pain of discipline and you just kept throwing that credit card down and throwing that credit card down and throwing that credit card down. When the bill came this week, you experienced the pain of disappointment. And you see, here's what I've discovered about those two pains. The pain, the pain of discipline always ends with something good. The pain of discipline 
as painful as I am making time to study God's Word, as I'm making time to be engaged in worship, as I'm making time being obedient to His truths, there is some pain at that moment. I might get a little less sleep, but guess what? I'll end up more rested. I may not get to enjoy so many of the toys, whoo, but I don't mind it when the bill shows up. You see, there's some momentary pain that comes with discipline, but the end result always, always ends up with contentment. But the pain of disappointment, because of the lack of discipline, never has a good ending. I will not lie to you, it will have a good brief moment, but the end result is always frustration, aggravation, annoyance. So where do you want your pain to come from? Uh, the, other, the, other, the other one line of the sportcaster gave that I believe was God's voice to me that day is, is your life a reflection of convenience or consistency? In other words, do I just make the decision that's convenient? Throw the plastic down. Have the affair. Let's just move in together and see how this thing works. It's cheaper. That, that, that's convenience. Or is there consistency to the truth of God being functional in my life so that whether it is a social choice or a financial choice or a spiritual choice or a relationship choice, I am consistent with God in my life. What is it for you? Here is something the wisest man who ever lived wrote in Proverbs 17, 24. I'm going to read it to you from two translations. The Good News Version says it this way. An intelligent person. So here, here's a test for you guys. Here's your IQ test today. You can determine whether you're intelligent or not. An intelligent person aims at wise actions. But a fool goes in many directions. A discerning, NIV translation this way, a discerning person. Do you want to know if you have discernment? A discerning person keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wanders to the ends of the earth. Man, when I read that last week, I do exactly what Solomon was talking about, not because I'm wise or smart, but because of experience. I've learned that often in a counseling situation, the biggest frustrations of counselors is a person who's come to you for help because their life's a mess. And as you try to give some direction about the key area that they want to run over here and they want to run over here and they want to talk about this, they, 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 that's why their world's a mess. Is they make the decisions of convenience rather than consistency, rather than stay focused and deal with this issue. We run from it so that I don't have to deal with it. We deal with another one and another one, and we chase things all the way to the end of the earth. What I want to do very quickly, I think I can do this in 10 minutes, okay? And that'll only be three minutes late. I have in my pocket keys. These are keys. I know it looks like just one. However, if I do that, there's another one. So I have keys here. Keys are used, and this is an example, are for two things. Keys are used to open doors and to start things. That's what keys are for. So, as we look at 2018 as an open door, key number one, let's start it right. Key number two. And I'm going to give you four keys real quick that help us do just that. It is my prayer that this will get us started in the right direction. And I'm going to do this very simply, A, B, C, D, Okay. A, B, C, D. <laughs> My math's not so good, okay? A, B, C, D. Here we go. A, accept responsibility for your own life. While we may not be in control of all the circumstances we face this coming year, we do have our hand on the control lever of how we will act and respond. We need to understand there are three kinds of people in life. There are accusers, there are excusers, and there are choosers. Accusers are those who always blame somebody else for their problems. Their favorite phrase is, I would have, but they. I would have, but he. 
I could have, but she. We always blame somebody else. I've discovered that whenever I want to procrastinate on something, any excuse will do. Listen to what the wisest man who ever lived wrote in Proverbs twenty-two thirteen. A lazy man, a lazy person. Okay, I've given you a test for intelligence and discernment. Now I'm going to give you a test for self-examination only. Are you lazy? A lazy person is full of excuses. Here's the whole verse. A lazy person is full of excuses. I can't go to work, he says, because if I go outside, I might meet a lion in the street and get killed. That's about as stupid as some of your excuses, isn't it? There are choosers. I choose to accept responsibility for my life. I will not blame others. I will not create excuses to excuse myself. I choose to accept responsibility. And in accepting responsibility, I now choose to be dependent upon Jesus for my life. I'm not going to be dependent upon the crowd or the magazines or the culture I'm a part of or my own weak self. I choose Jesus. He is my choice. That's the A. The B, believe that change or transformation is possible. Stop saying, I can't, and start saying, he can. The person that believes that Jesus is a source of change will change. Philippians chapter 4, 13 says it this way. The Jerusalem translation uses these words. There is nothing that cannot be mastered in my life with Christ who gives me strength. The NIV says, I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. Watch your hurt. Watch your hang up. Watch your habit. Doesn't make any difference what it is or the combination of all three. It can be mastered in your life if Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you're struggling with figuring out how to do that, on Thursday night, every Thursday night, right over in that building, we have Celebrate Recovery. And you can recover from your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups. Change, transformation is possible. The Bible is full of stories of people that God has called and touched their life and they were transformed. God called a man named Moses and said, I want to use you to rescue a nation. Moses said, me? I've been kicked out of the country because I'm a murderer. I'm tending my father-in-law's sheep. On top of that, I stutter a lot. You want me to be the leader of people? God said, yes, I'm going to use you. And he did. God used a stutterer as his mouthpiece. You see, folks, limited skills is not an excuse for serving the Lord. God will not reject you for limited skills. Here's another example of that. God called another man by the name of Gideon to lead the nation into victory over their enemy. And he said, I'm going to use you, Gideon. And Gideon said, whoa, not me, Lord. I'm the youngest kid in the poorest family and the smallest tribe of the nation. I don't have the social status to be a leader of people. And God said, you are my man. And he was and he did. God called Mary Magdalene, a woman of questionable reputation, to serve Jesus. And do you realize, according to Matthew 28, this woman with a questionable reputation was the first one to share the gospel that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. God called a Samaritan woman who he met at the well, and her reputation was not questionable. Everybody knew what she was like, and God chose her to start a revival in her hometown. You see, God can use you, and God can use me, and reputation and social status and limited skills be damned. The good news is God wants to use us. First, we must accept responsibility for our own life, and second, believe that transformation in Jesus Christ is possible. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed or shaped by the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your minds. That is what God will do with us. C, clarify our priorities. What is really important? Most people have never made those decisions about what's important. They usually try to ask her the question of what makes me happy. I got to tell you what. I'm getting older, so I say things a little more bluntly than I used to. I am tired of people telling me all I want for my kids is for them to be happy. They'll be happy, die, and go to hell probably because of that. That's all you want is happiness. Because they'll find happiness in circumstance, not choice. Contentment and joy and peace comes with right choices, not happiness. 
We have to figure out what is important. Happiness or God's wisdom. Happiness or contentment. Because they are often not one and the same. Many happy people are never content. I can promise you content people are joyful. Promise you that. I'm sorry. I kind of got off course. There are some things in life that we do that are permissible. Paul said, all things are permissible for me, but all things are not expedient. Everything that is permissible is not necessarily necessary. Permission is not synonymous with best. We are going to have to make decisions of what is good and what is better, what is better and what is best. But not all are beneficial. We live in a time in which we think being busy is good. And we've become often too busy for God. Let me highlight three things to clarify, um, to clarify our priorities. Here's what I suggest. At least the top three ought to be in your life. Our relationship with God needs to be most important. If you're married, you will be the best spouse you can be if, you've got, if you love God more than you love your spouse. You see, if you love God most, you will love your wife or your husband best. But if you do not love him most, you will love your spouse less than what they deserve and what God is capable of doing through you. If you love God more than your children, I always remember, yeah, and I just forgot the name of the movie. It was a series uh, back in the either late 70s or early 80s, um, Roots. Do you remember Kunta Kente? You have no idea who Kunta Kinte is, do you? <laughs> you don't either, do you? Kunta, yeah, all right, you guys do. Kunta, I mean, you guys need to show your kids roots, all right? Great, great. And I remember Kunta Kinte standing out there, all right, in the middle of the wilderness, holding his baby up as an offering back to God. That's exactly what Moses did with Isaac, and it's exactly what godly parents should do with their children. They're yours, Lord. They're yours. We also need to understand our relationship with our family. How are we going to build stronger and better relationships with our family? Oh, by the way, if you want a healthy relationship with God, three quick things. Bible study, fellowship with others, and community worship. Sounds like church and small groups to me. Those are not the prerequisite to loving God most, but I tell you what, they help a whole bunch. How do we improve our relationship with our family? What are we going to do to build stronger and better relationships with our family? What are we willing to change about ourselves that will help us accomplish this? Remember, busy is not the same as important. Parents, you face a tough time in life. We keep our kids too busy doing stuff, and we think we're helping them. We need to cut out some of the stuff in our kids' lives. They need more time to rest. They need more time to hang with family. Shelly and I were at the Amish. Oh, Jiminy Christmas. I just looked at the clock. We were in Amish country. And one of the peculiar things that they told us about the Amish home is they don't heat the upstairs. No heat upstairs. You know why? So it keeps the family downstairs together. Wow. They hang out together. And then we need our relationship with our church and our church family. What are we willing to do to improve God's church in keeping the commission that he has given to us consistently? I think these are the things that are important. And the D and the ABCD, don't wait to begin. Do it now. Those might be the three most important words to change in your life. Do it now. If you and I wait for the right situation, the right circumstance, we will miss it altogether. The wise man in Ecclesiastes 11.4 said, If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get it done. And he's right. I'll close with this. John Maxwell, in a book called Developing the Leader Within You, told this story. He said, A Middle Eastern mystic said, I was a revolutionary when I was young, and my prayer to God then was, Lord, give me the energy to change the world. I think I prayed that very same prayer. The mystic went on to say, when I approached middle age, I realized my life was half gone without changing a single soul. So I changed my prayer. Lord, give me the grace to change all of those who come into contact with me, my family and my friends, and with this, I will be satisfied. Now that I am an old man and my days are very limited, I have begun to see how foolish I have been. 
my one prayer now is this. Lord, give me the grace to change myself. If I had prayed that prayer from the start, my life would not have been wasted. You and I can only make the choice to let God change us. But I promise you, if we let him do that, he will ripple the change into the lives of others. You saw some of that here today. What kind of person will you be in 2018? Will you be an accuser, an excuser, or a chooser? The choice is yours. What will it be? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I pray that we're looking in a mirror right now. And we're asking you to give us direction to identify where we are at this very moment in our life. Are we the accuser, the excuser? And Father, when we determine what it is, I trust all of us will become the chooser to let you do something significant in our lives. You will make a difference in us. And you always promise if, we, if you make a difference in us, you will also make a difference through us. And if that will be the case, at the beginning of 2019, we'll probably baptize more than we did at the beginning of 2018. Thank you for what you're prepared to do if we choose you, your wisdom, and your ways. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.